talking about the quest to improve livestock productivity, understanding the phenotype-genotype connection. And as Kathy said, uh, I'll just be wrapping up all, most of the presentations, or all of them that uh, we have had today. So the outline I've present, I've, I'll be talking about, first of all, we'll look at the traits that should be tracked, and then the factors that influence the phenotypes. Then we'll look at information that's required for performance evaluation. And finally, we'll look at the role of genomics and how it can be integrated for, uh, into producer operations. How many, how many uh, producers here are cow-calf guys? Almost everybody. Who didn't make money this year? Who didn't make profit this year? I guess nobody, because, <laughs> because the, the, the record prices uh, you know, for, for cattle this year was really off the charts. But could you imagine if the price would go the direction of oil today. Can you imagine what will be happening? So most of the things that we've been talking about is how we need efficient animals. We need good animals. And there is no way we can do that without measuring. And even though the prices are good, when you combine it with efficient production efficient animals then you would have even more profits so that tells us that evaluating the performance of animals if, and not just the performance of all animals individual animals is very very important most of the speakers before me had said that measurement is important for improvement we can go further to say that it helps you to understand whether it even needs any improvement or not. Because if you understand the current state of the traits or whatever you want to improve, or whatever or the, the traits that you're keeping track of, then that will let you know whether you need to improve it or not. I have a, if, if in this diagram, if this is the current position of your herd average. Your knowing the current position would let you, will, will give you that understanding whether it is the optimum position or whether you will be able to improve something on, on the herd average. So we can decide to go to the right to increase it or we can go to the left to decrease it. So knowing the current herd performance would determine which direction you want to go. Now some producers, or most producers, face challenge with measurement, measuring uh, phenotypes on their animals. From my interactions with most of them, the first thing is time. Maybe they don't have the time to collect the phenotypes. The second thing would be resources like labor. They don't have enough labor, enough hands to help them to collect the phenotypes. And the third one is information management because most of them would regard that there's lots of paperwork involved in it. Jason had indicated that most of this could be overcome just by including and using the right technology. So you can imagine this guy saying, if I had known they, w they wanted me to use all this information, I wouldn't have asked for it. So sometimes the information could be very overwhelming. Is there something else that we need to add to this list? Is there something else that would be a challenge to you collecting information? that should be added to this list. Any, any idea? Suggestions? Apathy. Sorry? Apathy. Apathy, yeah. Any other one? 
What of, what of herd size? Is it a challenge? When you go from 100 to 200 to 400 to 600, is it, is it a challenge to collect phenotypes on animals? Yes, no, maybe. Looks like it's not a problem, and that's good. So, but what we're saying is that the right tools make the difference. If you have the right technology, if you have the right equipment, it will make it a whole lot easier for you to collect the information on, on, the, on the animals. So, next is what are the important traits? It's very easy to go out there and collect every information that you can, you can lay your hands on. But does it really help you and does it really help your operation? The focus should be on trades that affect your profitability. Each producer would have identified those traits that influence his or her bottom line. So it's not about amassing information. And those traits are actually your breeding or production objectives. Those traits should be defined, they should be definite. They should be measurable. So you wouldn't include something in your objective that you cannot measure. And finally, they should be realistic. It's, it's very important for, for, for you to set realistic goals. Now, based on, now, uh, since most of the producers here are cow-calf guys, you would have these uh, body size, fertility, and growth rate as part of your objectives. When we talk about traits, it, has, it will be either qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative if there are few categories of that particular trait. Or quantitative if it's a, if, if it's a continuous uh, uh, or many, if it has many levels. So, uh, but what you are looking at would be the phenotype, which is the observed level of the trait. So if we take a qualitative trait now, like color, coat color. It would be black, it could be white, it could be red. But if you have body weight, there are so many uh, uh, weight, uh, so there's a large range that could be available for you that you could measure. But one thing we need to know is that the phenotype is not working alone. There are factors that affect it, and that's the genotype and the environment. The genotype is, not, is nothing but the genetic makeup or the sum of genes that affect that particular trait. So in this example now, we'll have a genotype in terms of color, a different genotype in terms of color, in terms of horn status, or even in terms of muscling, muscling. Uh, for the Belgian blue, blue cattle that you have up there. So they're all affected by different genotypes. If you go back to, the, if you go on to the environment, they are all non-genetic factors. So you have mainly feed and, uh, and, and, what, feed and water resources. I know you might not see this clearly, but this is actually a dog out that is full, filled with uh, duckweed. So I think duckweed is a, a, a bad thing, but not necessarily. But it will always indicate the quality of, of the water. Are you able to see this result? Oh, okay. The pictures here, I have three bottles. It will be difficult for you to determine which of these water samples 
which of these water samples actually has these results. The result that is up there has a, a sulfate, dissolved sulfate to be 2,000 parts per million. And it was from a well. How do you think um, cattle would, would perform on that kind of water? With 2,000 parts per million of sulfate. How many people test their water here, please? One, two. If your neighbor had this kind of water, would you allow him to custom graze for you? So there are two things here. You either have, if, if it's for custom grazing, you're paying per head, you know, in based on intake, or you're paying based on gain. So if you are, if, 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 if you are paying based on gain, guess who's losing? Who's losing? The custom guy, right? But if you are paying on in, based on intake, you are losing. Because the intake you're paying for wouldn't really reflect on the gains that the animals are making. So this is a very, uh, this is an area that is ignored mostly in terms of water quality and feed quality. So if you have water that has high sulfate, it might lead to copper deficiency, having associated low gains, low reproduction, and other problems as well. So quality feed and quality water help provide the best environment for animals to attain their genetic potential. Without providing that environment, the animal wouldn't really show you what it's made of. So now the question is, how do we obtain these phenotypes? How do you obtain the phenotypes? Any? Who measures? Who weighs the animals? Or who, who's able to guess the, the weight of an animal? Who's able to guess the weight of an animal correctly? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, but it's, it's done. It's done. So what we're saying is that guessing is not measuring. Because when you guess, it leaves room for a large, it, it, it leaves a, you know, a large room for, for error. Imagine um, several blindfolded men describing an elephant. Depending on the position, the, the guy on the, at the back would say it's, it looks like a wall. Uh, probably the guy with the tail would say the elephant looks like a rope. So, from different perspective, who does this? This is tape, tape, uh, tape weight. Who uses tape weight? Tape weight. You do? How, how correct is it? So would you classify it as measuring or would you classify it as guessing? More of guessing. So using tape weight isn't really the best option if we need to measure animals. Because if something is 70% or 80% accurate, that's quite a large room for error. When we guess, it's <laughs> three things can happen. You can be very, you, you can be right. And what happens, you would, it, all, all the animals that you guessed were the right weight would, would be the right weight. Or you select the best animals. And what will happen to your operation? You move in the right direction. And that will be like 
that tile in the, in the middle. But sometimes you could guess 50% right or 50% wrong, and uh, you sustain some, some damage. The good ones will cancel out the bad ones, and you still remain at the same position that you were, that you started. But then if you guess wrongly, well, this might be the case. Oh, that one. So it's very, very important to, to measure and not guess. Which tools do we use to manage these data that we're collecting? The tools have to be easy and they need to contain comprehensive information. Naomi had uh, shown a simple tool, which is the pocket record book. There are sophisticated tools which Kathy had talked about. BioTriad, Catamax, and all that. But the thing is, collecting all the information without the intent to use them wouldn't do any good. It's as good as not collecting at all. Because you've wasted time, you've wasted resources, and actually you might have wasted information as well. But the thing is that for the sophisticated tools, the functionality will determine how much you pay for them. And sometimes they may be worth it, especially if you are keen on moving in the right direction. When we go into performance evaluation, I could be interchanging performance evaluation, genetic evaluation, they will be the same thing. It, it's all about identifying the right animal with the superior genetic merit. Because when you select animals based on phenotypes, there are genotypes there that may not be the one that you're looking for. How many select replacement heifers and bull or bulls here? Do you keep replacement heifers? Okay, how many, how many uh, keep bulls? There's none. So, but it, it's very important for you to identify the ones that have the superior uh, merit, superior genetic merit that would support your uh, breeding objectives or your production objectives. And you wouldn't do that without getting the phenotypes and the pedigree information. Phenotypes, you need to collect records on the particular animal and on its relatives as well. Pedigree information could be easy if you have single sire herds or if you're using artificial insemination. It's very easy to know, uh, you know which animal has got which calf. But if you have a multi-sire herd. Even the bulls wouldn't know which one is their calf. And the cows as well wouldn't know which one is theirs. So it becomes challenging. And that's where uh, uh, Steven, Steven's Q-Link comes in. So you could use different, thing, different um, uh, samples be it tail hair or uh, blood or ear tissues to identify which bulls would have sired uh, which calves. When we say that the pedigree is very important, we need that to identify the proportion of genes that individuals have in common. Because when you have the, you know that an animal is related to itself 100%. Identical twins share 100% of, of the genes. So in order to identify what proportion that individuals have, what proportion of genes that individuals have in common, it's very important to know what the relationship is like. 
father son uh, 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 parent child uh, relationship will, will be 50 percent because each parent will pass down approximately 50 percent of its gene to to its offspring and when we say additive genetic relationships we're looking at those the genes that are passed down from parents to offspring, so those that can be inherited. And when you combine the pedigrees and the phenotypes using complex um, statistical equations, you are now able to identify each animal's breeding value by comparing its performance with the average in the herd average within the contemporary group. The EBV, or the estimated breeding value, is the genetic worth of that individual. And when you divide it by two, it gives you what the progeny would, com would be compared to other progenies within that contemporary group. So a, a typical ABV, EPD, ex, uh, the expected progeny difference for this particular individual for birth weight would be 1.8 pounds higher than other progenies within that contemporary group. But more importantly, and we need to look at the accuracy. Here the accuracy is about 99%. But what does it mean? It's a measure of confidence that the breeding value or the expe expected progeny difference that we have gotten is the actual or the true uh, breeding value. Nobody sees breeding value, but we use the phenotypes to estimate what the breeding value is. Not only the phenotype, would, uh, but you would use the phenotypes and the relationships which you have generated from the pedigree to estimate the genetic worth of that individual or of the offspring. The 99% here means that the animal would have, you would have collected lots of records on the animal in order to show that yes, that the, the, you have a small margin of error in determining its actual breeding value. Data quality affects the evaluation results. What this means is that if you are treating an animal favorably, if you are feeding it more than others, you would expect it to produce better or have higher productivity. But you cannot compare it within that group because you are not um, given a fair comparison. This happens when animals are creep fed or you, you have uh, a, a favorite animal that you're keeping very well. So it's, it wouldn't be fair enough to compare that animal with others in the herd. One thing we need to know is that the use of performance evaluation or genetic evaluation leads to improvements that are permanent and are cumulative. And using this method is best with traits with high heritability, traits that you can easily measure and you could measure cheaply as well, and traits that are collected on live animals. But we know that that doesn't happen every time because there are some times when the traits would have low heritability, such as fertility or reproduction. Or traits that are very expensive to measure, um, such as feed efficiency or uh, longevity. Or traits that you collect when the animal is dead, and that would be uh, carcass traits. So in that instance, genomics becomes very important. Genomics is nothing but the study of the genome. And it's this use of the four building blocks of DNA, the adenine, uh, thymine, 
cytosine and guanine. The cattle genome has three billion uh, chemical bases, ATCG. But along, those, along the genome, you find positions where different individuals have uh, different letters. And one unique thing is that those letters or those differences in, in the nucleotides or the chemical bases are inherited. They are stable and abundant. In the cattle, we have about three to four million uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. And that's the single point differences between individuals. And they, these SNPs, as we call them, could be used as landmarks or genetic markers to identify differences uh, between animals for different phenotypes. So using these SNPs helps improve, helps, uh, improve the accuracy of genetic evaluations. And this is because when you see that a parent passes down 50% of its genes to, to the offspring, it's actually a sample 50%. A sample 50%, and that's why the progeny wouldn't be exact, because if it is the same 50% that is being passed down, then you would have all the progeny resembling each other. But because it is a sample 50%, then the genomics or these SNPs would give us more accurate or more precise proportion of the genes that the uh, SIP groups or the individuals share in common. You could use these, um, you could use those SNPs to identify the prop, uh, to identify what proportion in variation of or in changes in the phenotype that they actually account for, and that's the molecular breeding value or molecular score. And when you integrate these molecular uh, molecular uh, um, scores into a traditional, into a traditional uh, genetic evaluation, you would have a genomically enhanced EBV. And the animals that are genotyped usually have increased accuracies because of the more precise uh, relationships, more precise uh, identification of the uh, proportion of genes that they share with other individuals. So that would increase their accuracy. So in terms of advantages of genomics, it increases the accuracy of genetic evaluations and increases the confidence. Next, you have, you're able to make early, early uh, selection decisions, thereby reducing the um, generation interval. You're able to increase genetic progress because you have increased accuracy and shortened generation interval. You're able to save on cost because these animals that you've identified, uh, Stephen had talked about the TT phenotype and the CC, tenotype, uh, CC uh, uh, genotype, sorry. TT genotype and the CC genotype. That tells you that you don't need to pull these animals on test before you identify their performance. So you're able to do it, know it of, of the, uh, immediately just by genotyping. And it, will, it could help in marker-assisted management. Putting different animals on different uh, paths on uh, feed or feeding regimes. So how can you integrate genomics? It's best to start off with traditional genetic evaluation. If you're not recording, if you're not recording traits, if you're not keeping track of traits, then it will be difficult to start off on genomics. So 
So it's important to start off with identifying each animal individually. And Canada has a fantastic system whereby the, the use of uh, 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 animal identification, radio frequency identification tags, you know, has facilitated this process. You should initiate a record keeping protocol. One that is easy, one that is electronic, and one that is efficient. If you, would, if you have some good animals that you think would have great gen genetic merit, it's, you could collect hair samples. Hair samples, especially if they have the, root hair, the roots, can stay for, for quite a long time. Especially if you store them in a cool, dry place in an envelope, sealed and uh, labeled. It's important for you to change over your paper records to electronic formats because then it will be easier for you to access any information on, on each individual animal that you, you are interested in. Another thing is that you could use genomically tested bulls. But you wouldn't be able to apply genomically tested bulls if you're not able to match it with your cows because if you have uh, GBV on a, on, a, on a bull and you, you don't have the same uh, evaluation, you don't have the same information on your cows, it's, it's difficult to, to really match and know which direction you want your, your herd to go. So at this point, um, the, the take home message is that guessing leaves a large room for error. You need to collect phenotypes that support your breeding objectives. When we track information, when we collect and record information, you're able to manage, you're able to monitor, and you're able to make mating decisions. If you're collecting records without in using them when you are making selection decisions, it really doesn't help because you're just using visual appraisal without the evaluation or the results from the phenotypes that you have collected. And finally, genomics gives that opportunity for a higher profitability. I'm, I'm wondering, so what do you think is the phenotype genotype connection? That connection is actually you. Because you have to make the decision to collect the information that would give you the value on your animals. And I want to end with this saying that the secret of success in life is to be ready for the opportunity when it comes. So, is there any questions?